Did you know that 90% of people, it is estimated, have a deviated septum? And the deviated septum is a little bit of crookedness in the nose. In this video, we'll learn from Barbara O'Neill summarizing her insights on naturally repairing a deviated septum to keep your respiratory system functioning smoothly. Barbara O'Neill suggests several holistic approaches to help manage a deviated septum. She go over breathing techniques, proper foods into the diet, use of oils and herbal remedies, lifestyle changes. Stay with us until the end as we reveal the key to living a healthy, long life. Everyone that has a set of lungs should be here. <laughs> the respiratory organs are very important. Do you remember the most vital element needed for life? It's oxygen. And oxygen is taken into our body through our lungs. And there's only one way that the oxygen should be getting into our lungs, and that is through our nose. Nose, let's make a list of what nose does. And you might be surprised at this list. It's not a surprise that it purifies the air. Nose warms the air. And that's important because we're warm-blooded creatures. And when you open your mouth wide and take air in there, it doesn't, does not warm the air. <coughs> Nose also moistens the air. So it prepares it perfectly. And nose also pressurizes the air. I think that should be a Z. It also balances blood gases. Only nose does this. Mouth does not do that. And many people's respiratory organs are suffering because bad air is going into their lungs. And this is not the odd time it happens or the odd time it does. It's just day after day after week after week after month after month after year after year after year. And so then the question arises, well, why do people breathe through their mouth? because their noses are blocked up. Did you know that 90% of people, it is estimated, have a deviated <coughs> septum? And the deviated septum is a little bit of crookedness in the nose. And one of the reasons that this happens is mouth breathing. Because when you breathe predominantly through your mouth, the little canals at the back of your nose close up. And if someone wanted to have the back of their nostrils cleared out, can you imagine how painful that operation is? And sometimes if it doesn't work and they go in again to drill out the back, they can drill too much and that person will be left with an empty nose for the rest of their life, which is incredibly painful. But you know, there is no need to have any operations on your sinus, on your nose. No, no, no very painful and there's no need because believe it or not one of the easiest ways to clear the nose is to close your mouth and not breathe through your mouth and force your body to breathe through your noses and then little by little by little those little canals at the back of your nose they start to widen you know the old saying, if you don't use it, you will lose it. It's absolutely so for those little canals at the back of the nose. And when you realise what nose does, you can see it's imperative that we breathe through our noses. And then someone might say, but I'm all blocked up. Why? Possibly because of breathing in chemicals. Breathing in chemicals can irritate the mucous membranes 
And when the mucous membranes are irritated, more mucus is produced to protect the mucous membranes. That's what the mucus is there for, to protect. So chemicals can do it. Also mould. Breathing in mould, mould is toxic. The body sees the mould as an enemy. So when you breathe in mould, again, that can cause excess mucus, which tends to block the airways. And so the easiest thing for the person is just to breathe through the mouth. But there are certain foods that are classified as mucus-forming foods. So the five most common allergens, and we've looked at these a few times, is dairy. Professor Walter Weith has a, a great series on health, and one of, his, one of his presentations is called Utterly Amazing. And it shows how many people have allergy to dairy. The only people that really can handle dairy or cow's milk is when it's in their, in their heritage. Maybe your, your fifth generation dairy farmers. <laughs> so it's in your genes, the enzymes are in your gut. But you know, cow's milk is excellent milk for baby calves. And milk, God, God created mammals to produce milk to feed their babies. So when people say, what milk do you drink, Barbara? I say, I'm weaned. I eat food. Because <laughs> milk is for babies. And traditionally, in a lot of dairy farming countries, the cow's milk, a lot of it was made into yogurt. A lot of it was made into fresh cheeses. And when, when the cow's milk is made into yogurt and made into the fresh cheeses, it actually breaks down, the culturing process breaks down those, those big curds and does make it a little bit easier for the gut to digest. It is estimated in Australia, I was reading the figures, that 60% of Australians have an allergy to milk. And yet far more than 60% of Australians would drink milk. But if the milk was raw from an organic cow, the allergy would be brought down to probably about 30%. If you were to give a newborn calf the cow's milk that's in the, in the supermarket, that calf would die because it has no vitamin C in it, the whole structure has been changed. Pasteurisation of milk only was really necessary because of dirty dairies. If the dairy's clean, if the milk, everything around it is clean, that there's no need to pasteurise it. But when you bring it to the boil and pasteurise it, it changes the milk, it kills the vitamin C in the milk. So dairy is a very mucus forming food and also the hybridised wheat. The wheat was hybridised in the 1950s and the hybridisation of the wheat created a very complex protein structure. And that protein structure is so complex that the body creates antibodies because it's very difficult for the gut to, the gut to break down this very complicated protein structure. You see, the original wheat, Enkenhorn, it had a very fragile protein structure, very easy to break down. And wheat traditionally was always cultured, always made in the sourdough bread. Let's have a look at the best history book we've got, which is the Bible. And let's have a look at Moses in the desert with millions of people. And every year they commemorated the Passover. The Passover when the angel passed over the, the doors of the Israelites, if you know the story. So they commemorate that time. And in commemoration of the Passover, for one week they put all leaven out of their houses. What was the leaven? It was none other than the sourdough culture. You see, yeast was not produced really until the Industrial Revolution. So before the Industrial Revolution, all bread was made with the sourdough method. I've just come from Germany. There's, you know, in fact, the best bread I've ever tasted is German bread. You can get it anywhere. <laughs> Very nice. And it's, 
It's mostly, there are some that do the yeast, but it's mostly made with the sourdough method. And the sourdough or the cultured bread breaks down the protein or the gluten in the grain. So when you eat sourdough bread, you're eating pre-digested grain because the culturing process has broken down that, that uh, protein structure. But the hybridised wheat of the day, it's a very complex structure. And even when the hybridised wheat of today is made into a sourdough, it is still more complex a structure than the original. And that's why a lot of people react to that hybridised wheat. Oats are a food that are very high in something called lectins. You've heard of lectins? Mm -hmm. So let me give you a quick explanation of lectins. Lectins are found in unripe fruit. And when the fruit ripens, there's no more lectins. So it's almost as if God put it there to deter us from eating the unripe fruit. Now let's say that someone eats fruit that's not quite ripe. If they've got good gut flora, that disarms the lectins, so it doesn't even get into the blood. Remember though that gut flora plays a protective role? If the lectins do get into the blood, they cause inflammation. Traditionally, oats, well, the Scottish have always eaten a lot of oats. Oats were soaked all day and slowly cooked all night, and that disarms the lectins. Legumes are high in lectins, but if you soak them and rinse them well and pressure cook them or slow cook them, that disarms the lectins. Tomatoes are... Uh, you call it bell pepper and uh, eggplant or aubergine, high in lectins. But traditionally, the Europeans always de-seeded and skinned the tomatoes and the bell pepper, and that takes the lectins away. So again, getting back to the traditional way of cooking foods disarms the lectins. And because most people don't cook their oats enough, most people, maybe even quick oats, I said, quick oats can be cooked in, in 10 minutes. Well, actually, they're not. The starch structure has not been broken down in 10 minutes. And so that creates also lectins, which is high inflammation. Peanuts are commonly contaminated with mould and also refined sugar. Refined sugar just feeds the microbes. And so these are what we call the five allergen foods. And that can cause a lot of excess mucus to be in the, in the respiratory, especially around the nasal. And so the, the result of that is that the person now breathes through their mouth. So when someone is a mouth breather, then, then you investigate why. And when a person is a mouth breather, often because of exposure to chemicals or moles or the allergen foods, and sometimes all of that, then the air is not being purified and it's not being pressurised and it's not balancing blood gases. And this is a big contributing factor to lung problems, to asthma, 